this is a series about long-term thinking. And what's been especially fun about it is to talk to speakers and get them engaged and they then realize that what they're doing actually has a long-term thinking aspect to it. Now it is the case um, here that one of our, actually our first sponsor, uh, Will Hurst, who is here and will join Chris on the stage, uh, said, you know, there's really a time dimension to this and he'll tell you some about what he thinks about that tonight. So I uh, called Chris and said, there's a time dimension. He said, yeah, I know. Uh, and so we got into exploring it further and so this talk um, in anticipation, just a month or so, of his book, The Long Tail, which is coming out, is part of expanding what has turned out to be an extremely powerful idea. One of those ideas that will probably be around for a couple decades uh, because of a change that the internet has wrought. And so you're part of that process tonight. Uh, I'm wearing the yellow hat as an indication these are the people who collect your questions. We'll bring them up to me and Kevin Kelly in the front. And it's gonna be an editor fest. Will Hurst is an editor, Chris Anderson is an editor, I'm an editor, Kevin Kelly's an editor. That's what we do. Chris Anderson, it's yours. Thank you and good evening. What I'd like to do uh, first is run through about 20 minutes of just um, a little, a little background and, and framing of what the long tail is, what it means, and then changing dimensions, you know, looking from the traditional concept of the long tail to, to, the, to the time version of it. Um, there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of charts and data. Uh, you don't have to pay attention to it. It's, it's illustrative. Um, the book, the research, the article. And most of, my, most of my thinking about this is all driven by numbers. Um, we, we live in, we're very fortunate to live in a moment where the economics of the 21st century lie in the server databases of Google and Yahoo and Netflix and Amazon. And um, if you only look, you can see extraordinary things. And uh, surprisingly, a few people are looking. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have their cooperation. And you'll see some of that, um, but uh, we're just scratching the surface of the really different economics, culture, and um, lens on our culture, lens on our world around us that we can see out there in these databases. It starts with numbers, um, and this is, this is the sort of the shape of our age, I believe. It's called, called a power law. Uh, you may know it also as a as a Pareto, uh, Wilfred Pareto was the Italian economist who observed that uh, the 20 percent of the Italian population had 80 percent of the land, leading to the 80-20 rule, the notion that a small number of things have a large impact. Um, low frequency, high amplitude events. Um, earthquakes are distributed um, in power laws. A small number of big earthquakes and a large number of small ones. Populations, cities are distributed in power laws. A small number of very big cities and a large number of small ones. Um, the, the shape is kind of a one over x. It's, uh, it's an exponential. It's the simplest possible curve, um, and yet it turns out to be absolutely ubiquitous in human affairs, economies, and nature itself. Um, if you plot a power law linearly, it looks like that, with you know, a small number of things on the left, high impacts, and a large number of things on the right. It happens to go on forever. I've cut it off. I've truncated it uh, at a random number. Um, if you plot it log log, which is to say that each, each, each axis now goes in order of factors of 10, you should get a straight line. Um, sometimes a line, the slope of the line doesn't matter. It depends on, on the market, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the units you're using, but it should be a straight line. Unless it's not. This is U.S. box office over a three-year period. Um, the box office gross is on the left, exponential in a, in, a, in a log scale, and the ranking of the films, the number one film, which did several hundred million dollars, all the way down to about uh, 1,500 films. Um, something happens, right? I don't know whether you can see this little line, but something happens right there. And um, what happens right there is really interesting because it sort of tells you everything you need to know about, about the distortions of the last century 
in our economy and, and culture. What happens right there is not that the films got worse. They didn't switch into foreign languages. They didn't stop making films. What happened is they ran out of screens. The carrying capacity of the American theatrical network, mostly the, the, the big screen megaplexes, is about 120 films um, a year. Uh, however, the number of films shown in film festivals is closer to 13,000. The vast majority of films never make it to the megaplex. They never get out there. They just, there they are, are not enough screens to show all the films. And so as a result, you end up with this distortion. You end up with the, with the, uh, the marketplace apparently falling off the cliff, not because people didn't want those films, not because they didn't exist, not because the films weren't good, but because of a scarcity effect, a bottleneck in distribution. And so in a sense, everything we think about, to the extent that we thought that Hollywood represented American taste, to the extent that we thought that hits were the sort of, were, were, were what our society, uh, uh, collective society wanted, it turns out that in fact hits are what this, the distribution channel wanted. It only had so much shelf space. And so too for channels of television, for radio channels, for retail shelf space, every one of these traditional ways of distributing content, where I started my research, um, has a scarcity effect. And every one of those scarcity effects, every one of those bottlenecks, ends up distorting the market and, by extension, distorting our culture. In a sense, it looks like this. There is the same power law, and yet it just gets hacked off, truncated. But now we're entering an era where you have distribution methods that don't have scarcity functions, or at least they're, they're pushed much further down. The internet has infinite channels and infinite screens and infinite shell space. Um, and so what you, what you realize is when you go back to that, that line, you realize this pink bit right here is the latent market that we were missing before because we couldn't reach those products, because we couldn't connect supply and demand. And that right there is the market we're just now starting to explore, and it turns out to be remarkably large. Here's some actual data from, um, from Rhapsody, which is a subscription uh, um, online music service. It benefits from unlimited shell space. Um, what you have here in the red part is the, um, the albums and songs that are available in Walmart, which is America's largest CD retailer. Um, it has about 4,500 albums in the average Walmart. So these are the hits, and these are the, these are the, al the albums that Walmart has and Rhapsody has. Down here in the yellow, these are the niches. These are the albums, tracks, and other songs that Walmart doesn't carry, but Rhapsody does. What's notable about this is that although um, through some complicated math involving you know, converting albums to tracks, I, ca I, the, I calculate that the, that the uh, Walmart inventory is about equal to 25,000 tracks. Um, Rhapsody right now carries 1.5 million tracks. Uh, iTunes carries about 2 million tracks. The peer-to-peer -peer networks are, are looking at about 9 million tracks. There's probably 25 million tracks out there somewhere in vinyl, live, remix, all the other songs that, that, are, that are out there and could be and will be brought online. Um, it, another way of looking at it is right here. This is Walmart's inventory, and this is Rhapsody's inventory. We, what we've thought was the sort of the music market was a tiny, tiny fraction of the music market. In fact, you know, we're looking at order of magnitude uh, increase in inventory and variety. And so too for DVDs, blockbusters, uh, the average blockbuster carries 3,000 DVDs. Netflix is at actually 60,000 right now. Um, over here at Amazon, the typical Barnes & Noble or uh, Borders carries about 100,000 books. Amazon's now tracking 3.7. There's probably another, another 6 million books out there. Um, bring in the networked used book um, you know, stores, which are now sort of seamlessly integrated into these online marketplaces, and you could be looking at maybe as many as 10 million books in various, in various languages. Extraordinary increase in variety. And what you find is that, although we'd assumed, the retail channels had assumed that, that, that those niche low sellers were insignificant, sub-economic, uh, sub um, just not worth caring. In fact, when you add them all up, those onesies and twosies are starting to amount to significant markets. Um, in, in music, they are closing in on half the market, is now stuff not sold in Walmart. In, in, at Netflix, um, about a quarter of the market, a quarter of their rentals are things that aren't available in the Blockbuster. At Amazon, it's also about a quarter 
of the books now sold on Amazon are books that aren't available on a Barnes and Noble or a Borders. All those numbers are growing. It looks like we're, we're trending to an era where about half the market is sold through traditional retail channels, and the other half of the market is, is, is only available through these sort of abundant, you know, unlimited channels, such as, you know, on, with online in particular, but also things like, like the U.S. Mail, another powerful network, as Netflix uh, revealed. So, let's talk about the time aspect of that. And there I've been talking about sort of mainstream and niche. So, Blockbuster, Tower Records, Walmart, Borders, they tend to carry the hits. When you have, when, when shelf space runs at, you know, the, average, the, the cost of a shelf space for one DVD is $22 a year in, in Blockbuster. You need to, you need a lot of turns. You need to, it needs to rent quite often to pay back its shelf space. So they have to carry the most popular items. So that's the way I, I initially looked at, at the long tail. Hits to the left, niches to the right. But there's another way to look at it. Um, when you think about it, um, as thing over time, even hits become small sellers. Even hits, uh, you know, even, even hits uh, lose their, their traction in the marketplace and they sell less. And so the tale is actually made up of a mix of some niche titles and some old titles. Um, for fun, I thought I would just uh, show you two Bs. That's the Bee Gees' first album. And this is uh, Broken Social Scenes' uh, uh, new album uh, called Beehives. This one was a number one and now is ranked around 20,000. This started at around 15,000, a very niche title, uh, just, a, just, a, just a year ago, and uh, is now uh, at around the same rank. The two of them are right next to each other in the long tail, but one's an old hit and one's a new niche. So we're mixing these two markets together, and they obviously have different, different behavior. So I, thought I set out to quantify this. And what I'd like to show you over the next few slides is really just a work in progress as we try, try to quantify the long tail of time. So if you tease apart, if you tease apart the reds and the blues, you basically have two dimensions. You have one that's sort of, it's niche versus mainstream, broad versus narrow, and the other, new versus old. Both have decay functions. Both, both have a, uh, a power law shape. But so how do, you, how do you combine the two? Well, I realize that there's sort of a topology um, here, that basically, you know, um, hits, Hits here, um, their sales decline over time. Well, that's true for niche titles. Their sales decline over time as well. But hits decline faster over time because they get farther to fall. Niches decline more, more, more slowly. And th there's some shape in there that will tell you a lot about how to predict the, um, you know, the, the latent demand in a marketplace. So what is that shape and how do we quantify it? Well, this is messy, but um, that's research often is. Um, what we did is we looked at um, the top ten, or the number, number one albums for the last, um, uh, the last ten years, and we looked at their current rating. And so what we assumed is that, that the newer they were, the higher the rating would be. They all started at one, and the new ones, you know, the one released this week is still one, the one released ten years ago has fallen to some other level. So we thought if we scatter plotted it, and then we could sort of, you know, Run a little, run a little, you know, sort of curve fitting and see what you can get a shape. And, you know, sure enough, but we can do more rigorous work than that. Um, there is a fantastic, uh, again, we're very lucky to live in a time where, where basically everything is measurable. Someone out there is tracking it. All these servers have all these data, and increasing data, and increasingly they're available. Um, there's a service called InfoFilter, uh, which kindly let me um, in. And um, we started tracking the decay function of albums on Amazon. Uh, basically, uh, the sales rank goes 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 up as the uh, as, as as the sales decline. Um, so here is a um, Arctic Monkeys, which which made it to here. It was released right there, and obviously in pre-release and pre-sales, it went up the charts. Then it hit. Then it, it peaked, you know, close to the day of release, and then it declined. So that's the decline function of an album that hit number, number two on the charts. Mm. Then, I took a, a, then we looked at a, a other albums. We've done these for hundreds. Um, but this one is a, a gospel album, also, um, also released around the same time. This one sort of started at number 500 and declined, and now it's, and now it's at about uh, uh, 1,500. 
Um, so a more gradual decline, a more gradual decay function. So you know, going back to this original chart, um, you can see that we're starting to kind of, if you wanted to, in music, you could start to kind of have a sense of what the exponentials were, what the, what the constants are to describe each one of these curves. Um, this, is, this is important, um, and, here, and here's why. Um, what do these five artists have in common? These five artists were five of the top ten top grocers last year in the music industry. Um, there is incredible demand for older stuff. Um, some of it's because it's good. Some of it's because we're nostalgic. Some of it's because we can get it. Um, but these are, just, these are just the hits. Each one of these did more than $50 million in business um, uh, last year. But half of the top 10 last year were basically classic artists. I find it odd that U2 is considered a classic artist now, but there, there you have it. Um, so so that, 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 that's music. Um, I'm going to now plow through a couple of other examples um, because then we can turn to the, the interactive component with, with Will. But um, it's true for DVDs as well. There's a very interesting service called DVD Station. And um, what it does is it takes a, it's got a box with a big hard drive, a terabyte drive, and a DVD burner in it, and a screen. And you could put it in any store. It could be a Blockbuster. It could be um, just a corner grocery. And um, you can basically pick a DVD to, it'll burn, and you can take it and rent it, and you can bring it back. Um, it, um, it can have more inventory than a Blockbuster, but it doesn't have to. What it does, more importantly, is it makes it, 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 it alleviates uh, one of the other problems of traditional retail, which is that it's very hard to find things. Um, you know, in, in traditional retail, the store is set up for one size fits all. The new stuff is stacked 100 high in the back. Uh, the, new, the older stuff is randomly put in some taxonomy that may not make sense to you. Um, I remember looking for Akira, uh, the Japanese anime. Um, is that science fiction? Is it kids? Is it foreign? Is it, is it you know, drama? Um, you know, wh where do, what section does it go in? You don't know, and often the clerks can't help you. What DVD station does by being a kiosk, it allows you to have a Google-like functionality. You can search. It has recommendations. You can see previews. You can read inf more information about it. Um, that's the, the two limiting factors in traditional retail are, are inventory and findability. Uh, this, is an ex this is an experiment in solving the findability problem. It's interesting what, what you see here. So right here, the, or the purple stuff represents the um, blockbuster sales, and the blue represents the DVD station sales. These are the same tracks, but as you see, we're going out now over uh, the same DVDs, rather, but as you can see, they're getting older. So here's the decay function over time, and what you see here is that the older titles, the older films, sell better or more popular when you can find them. Maybe that stands to reason. Um, and then you also see there's this interesting structure right here. These are classics. These are classics that people love. These are things that have passed the test of time, um, but have been lost in the aisles, lost in the, lost in the bins of a traditional blockbuster, but findable through a more Google-like interface. And so what you see is that the curve is flatter, and that, and that, there is there is, that the area under the curve is non-zero. This, this, this right here, five, six, seven years old, this is the, this is the world of blockbuster. Basically, their economics doesn't allow them to care about it. Um, but if you, have, but if, if you have abundant economics where you can carry everything, you realize that the demand is non-zero. For instance, um, here's another way of looking at it. This is the demand for um, one year or older. Um, you can see how much larger it is for the kiosk, Google-like way of finding, or Amazon or Netflix way of finding it. Same inventory, just more demand for the older tiles when you can get past the findability hurdle. What's interesting about the old stuff is that the economics, um, which we assumed were worse, are actually better. The reason is, is that the acquisition costs for DVDs have a decay function as well. Um, a brand new DVD costs about uh, $19 uh, to buy, and in Walmart is sold for about $16. They lose money on DVDs initially. Now, it's a loss leader, and they make it, and they, they attract people into the store with these cheap prices and then sell them refrigerators. Um, over time, the acquisition cost comes down dramatically. In the, in the fourth month, it's uh, now down to $15. And then right around here, it becomes profitable to sell. And as you can see, the price 
the blue line declines gradually, whereas the cost, the purple line, declines more rapidly. And so the margins go from negative to very positive over time. So because the, because the acquisition costs are, are cheaper, the older stuff is more profitable. Um, interestingly, um, it isn't just more profitable, it's actually more satisfying. Um, Netflix did some analysis on this. Netflix also has the capacity to have uh, unlimited inventory and to uh, recommend and, uh, titles that, uh, that you like based on your, your, your history and to give you um, previews and samples and more information. Um, what they find is that, um, as I just said, the older titles have a lower cost and so, and so higher margins for them. But what, they, what surprised them is that the satisfaction ratings were much higher on the older titles. And when you think about it, this makes perfect sense. Um, older titles have passed the test of time. They have, uh, the reviews have come in, word of mouth has spread, people know what they think. Newer titles, um, the quality of the title is overwhelmed by the marketing. In its first week, what you're seeing is, is a huge flood of marketing from the studios. Maybe you haven't read the reviews. Maybe you hadn't had a chance to talk to people. Maybe, maybe you know, the sort of consensus view has not come in. And so you tend to just sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're seduced by the marketing because it works. And what they found is that, is that the ratings on the new titles were significantly lower than the ratings for the old titles. So when you think about it, Blockbuster, which because of its, because of its need to stack them deep, and high, and to push, and the sort of studio-driven economics to push the new titles the most, are in the place where the movies cost the most and have the lowest, that, and, and return the lowest satisfaction. Whereas Netflix is in, the, is in the part where the movies, in the older films, where they push, they push the demand back over time, is in the part of the market where the movies cost the least and have the highest satisfaction. So Netflix is in the sweet spot of the industry, and Blockbuster is in the sour spot, simply because Blockbuster is driven by the tyranny of the new. Google is another exa interesting example of this. Um, uh, Will's in the news was in the newspaper business, and I'm in the magazine business. And I can tell you that there's the notion that you know that that n the new news is the important stuff, and the old stuff is fish wrap is is pervasive. Um, there was the, there was the presumption that your front page is what matters. Um, it's freshness. It's what's it's what's you know right here now, that is what's popular. Um, but Google doesn't think that way. Um, the way the Google algorithms work is that there's a number of factors that determine relevance, but one of the most important one is incoming links. You know, the consensus view on how important, relevant, and um, different content is. Older stuff has longer time to build up incoming links. Over time, the relevance, the quality, the sort of measured value of older stuff rises. And Google uh, actually doesn't even, the, the, uh, the, the uh, spider doesn't even get to the new stuff. So Google almost, you know, traditional Google, obviously they have Google News and Google Blog Search, but traditional Google won't even know anything over the, next, over the first 48 hours. And then over time, things get more relevant, not less. So as we, feed, as we see more and more of the traffic to all of our sites driven by Google, we find that it's not going to the front page traditionally. It's not going to the new stuff. It's going to the old stuff. Uh, here's, here's some data just from my... Uh, just, just, from our, just from our own sites, we find that 66% um, uh, of the search traffic is going to posts that are older than one month old. So uh, two-thirds of it. And as a result, um, uh, this is, um, uh, just, just to, just to uh, unpack this, um, this is the um, new stuff here. This is the old stuff that comes from search. And this is the old stuff that comes from links. What you're finding here is that this bit right there is driving demand. This is the growing part here, the stuff that's coming um, from search. And it is traditionally, and as you just see, two thirds of it is going to the old stuff, the stuff more than one month old. As a result, the archives are suddenly becoming really, really important. And you're, you're seeing the balance of the, tra the, of the gr traffic growth going to your old stuff. Uh, this, was, this is absolutely new. And suddenly it makes you realize that, that the presumption that there was no value, that you barely had to leave them, all, leave them all online, you certainly didn't need to sell, sell ads against them, is turning out to be completely wrong. We now realize that um, quality doesn't disappear over time. Instead, this recognition increases. I'll give you a few other examples before we, before we end and turn to Will. Um, the rise of print on demand is a real driver towards the backlist in books. Um, again, one of the problems with books is the notion of, of, of shelf space. The fact that the inventory cost of, sto of storing books is significant. 
Um, how would you store books with near zero inventory? The, you store them as digital files and you print them on demand. Uh, print on demand technology is basically just a big photocopier. Um, but um, you know, today, you'll buy books from Amazon that are print on demand and you don't know it. You cannot tell. Their color, they have, they have proper covers, um, they have charts, graphics. Um, you can't tell they're not marked in any way. Um, they just bought, uh, Google just bought, uh, sorry, Amazon just bought a print on demand company. There's six of them um, being started just this year. And what's fantastic about this is it not only allows you to take the older books and rather than taking them out of print, just taking them to print on demand. Um, they, they cost nothing to store. You print in small batches, sometimes as little as one um, when required. And the, um, the price is a little bit higher, but not a lot higher. And the margins are positive because there's no costs. As, it's, uh, as it sits there, it doesn't gather dust. It doesn't exist, in a sense, until it's printed. Um, What's, what's important about this is that it not only allows them to monetize these archives, monetize the back catalog, but it also allows them to smooth out demand at the front. One of the big problems with the book industry is the notion of returns. The, 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 um, uh, one of the policies of books is that bookstores are allowed to return new titles for free if they don't sell. Um, why would bookstores overorder, grossly overorder? Because they want to make sure they don't run out. If the costs are borne by the publisher, they might as well overorder um, and, and, you know, and, and, and pulp the rest send it back for credits. Um, however, there is a small cost because those books have to sort of sit in a warehouse, the, you know, the bookstore's warehouse. So if they could avoid that, they would. They just don't want to run out. Well, right now we print books in batch, big batches, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000. But if you could say, well, we're going to, you know, we're, it's not going to be 60,000 now and 60 months, 60,000 six months from now. It could be 60,000 now and as much as you need from now on. We can get it to you in 24 hours. We can print 30, 40, we can print 300, we can print 3,000 print on demand. We can smooth out the demand and you won't run out. Then the bookstores won't overorder. And so a technology that was designed to uh, sort of unleash the value in the archive is actually going to have most of its economic impact in smoothing out demand at the head of the curve. That's, that's a really important uh, advance in an industry that's struggling. Um, Movies right now, we're seeing the, uh, the rise of, of, uh, of very, very cheap DVDs. Uh, DVDs, again, um, especially through Amazon and, and, and Netflix, is a great way to distribute content without shelf space con constraints. And there is demand. Uh, for television, you're seeing uh, the rise of classic collections, um, which are, um, again, you know, I Love Lucy or, or, or anything else. There is demand for this. Some of it's nostalgia. Some of it's just it's good content. DVDs are a great way to distribute it. Um, one little note, um, in our analysis, we have found that television represents the biggest, the biggest divide between the amount of produced content and the amount of available content. The television model is one of just, you know, produce it. It, it, it exists ephemerally. It's broadcast for a brief window and then disappears. The vast majority of television isn't syndicated. The vast majority of television, television hasn't made it to DVD. Um, the vast majority of television wasn't TiVo'd. It's just gone. And yet it exists out there. And if you can clear the rights, which is something perhaps we may talk about a little bit more, we will, you find that there is an appetite for old TV. Um, if only you can get it out there. Um, a final example I wanted to give you is, is, is games. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gamer, and uh, I grew up in the generation that uh, had uh, the Nintendo and the Atari. And um, you know, a lot of us, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us think of this stuff very fondly. However, it's not available. If you don't have the original machine, um, you can't you can't play the games. Um, uh, there's this notion of abandonware. The manufacturers actually not only don't sell them anymore, but they won't let anyone else sell them. Um, they don't want to support it, and so it's so they live in this nether world. Um, one of the reasons is that the retail channels don't support um, old games. They're niche products, they have sm a small demand, but very passionate demand. But there's a new distribution channel in video games. It's online uh, marketplaces. And all three of the new consoles, the, um, the Xbox 360, the Nintendo Wii, and the uh, Sony PlayStation 3, I'm all going to have broadband distribution of games. And Nintendo, in particular, is building an emulator for all of its old systems right into the machine. So every game they've ever made will be playable on the new machine. Distribution costs, inventory costs, near zero. There's demand for this. We're finally able to tap them. So there's more of it in my book, which is coming out in, in July. Um, but we can get into further detail, I think, by uh, now turning to Will, who knows a lot about this. Will?
great talk, Chris. Uh, last time I saw you talk on these subjects was down in Udeo, and you added a tremendous amount of dimension. So I guess the first thing I want to do is maybe just slow the pace down a little bit and go through some of the things that you talked about. But um, you know, let's start with um, there's two dimensions of time that I'm particularly interested in, and, and you've probably done uh, the best job I've ever seen of quantifying these things so that we can talk about some of these things in terms of facts. But the two dimensions that interest me is one is sort of an evolutionary process. I think if you're talking about time, you're talking about change and evolution. And uh, certainly in this sort of large sphere of media properties, there are changes in distribution, changes in economics. There are some perpetual things. And, and I want to come back to that in sure. a split second. But um, you do see these bottlenecks. And, and uh, I, I, want, I, I just like to sort of think out loud with you a little bit. But uh, looking at television, let's take that as the first example. You know, when I was a kid, there were basically three networks, and a bunch of other also ran uh, uh, local independents, so to speak. And that was the scope of television. It seemed to satisfy people. But with the technology that um, cable television brought into the marketplace, starting with out of market and better signals and people that had two of the networks getting three, but it very rapidly became all 13 channels could have content. And then there was a creative response to that and, and a kind of marketplace evolutionary response, because all of a sudden we had MTV. There was nothing like that before. We had CNN. We had Discovery. We had all kinds of new content responses. So I'm kind of interested if, if the internet has sort of changed publishing, and magazines were changed maybe a decade earlier by desktop publishing, you know, there seems to be a, a, a kind of evolutionary pattern when you blow open the distribution, change the cost of entry, you get a creative response. So I, I wondered if uh, you had any thoughts about as we blow open internet distribution as it moves up into video, which is sort of the way a lot of us get news, for example. You know, what, what's your bet about the, uh, let, let's start with the creative, the creative community response. Sure. Um, let, let's just uh, start with, uh, I'll show you one, one, uh, one, one bit of data on this. Um, so uh, we have a precursor to the internet, which is in, in the form of cable. Um, we started, as you say, with four, with terrestrial broadcast and four networks. And then as, as people got more and more channels, we started to see the sort of the beginnings of an abundant distribution. Um, and then we now have, I, I guess, 900 uh, channels, maybe even 1,000 channels. Um, this right here, the, uh, the white line represents the rise of what they call multi-channel, which is basically cable. Um, and it's basically 95, it's almost all, all homes now have cable. And the black line represents what that did to the networks. Network share. Network share, exactly. And what we, what we found out is that we went from uh, people watching the network 75% of the time back when, they, back when there was fewer than half the homes had, had this sort of abundance of choice. Now it's, uh, it, it's, less, than, it's less than 50% of the time is, is spent watching uh, the network. So what that means is that, is that as people, you know, in 1957, 75% uh, of Americans watched I Love Lucy on a, on a, of American homes watched I Love Lucy on a Sunday night. It was, you know, it was, it was kind of the peak of lockstep culture where we all did the same thing at the same time, uh, the peak of the water, color, water cooler um, era. Um, now that we find more, 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 channels, more choice, we find we're, we're, we're fragmenting, we're distributing across these, the, these many, many channels. Um, the modern equivalent of that is YouTube or, or Google Video. Um, and you know, we've got now gone from 900 channels to an infinite number of channels. We've yeah. gone from commercial content to skateboarding videos um, up uploaded. Um, we find that um, we've gone from a kind of commercial uh, a marketplace where you know, sort of, you had to have a commercial reason for making video to an amateur marketplace where you don't need any reason to make video because the, the cost, everyone has a camcorder and, and, the, and distribution is free. Um, I think what you're finding is, is, is two things. First of all, you're finding that the, that the pool of, of producers 
is expanding hugely because we've democratized the tools of production and we've democratized the tools of distribution. So, you know, before you needed to sort of have gotten into the machine to get your stuff right. out. Now you don't have to get into the machine. You know, the machine is, we all have, we all have the necessary tools. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a member of, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, and we're also finding that the pool of, of, um, of viewers for this content is also growing. We assumed yeah. that there was no demand for amateur skateboarding videos. We assumed wrong. You know, uh, we, you know YouTube is, is, is partly um, uh, a, uh, a reflection of you know, pent-up demand for content, not to, for commercial content, not distributed at you know at the right time at the right channel, sort of a TiVo in the in the in the air, and partly demand for stuff that was never commercial in the in the in the first place. Um, I, I think it's I think we're seeing a um, a renaissance in 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 culture. We're seeing this extraordinary explosion of of talent, of variety, of choice, of kind of cultural richness that um, we had, we'd only had sort of glimpses of before in underground film festivals and you know one-on-one -on -one sharing. Now we can actually measure it and it turns out to be massive. Yeah, I would certainly agree. And uh, I think it's worth mentioning that um, simultaneously there's sort of an economic shift going on too because in the first part, in the left-hand side of this diagram, there was kind of a near panic yeah. in the traditional media corporate offices and in the right-hand side, which looks like the disaster continues, mm -hmm. there's actually been a, a sort of shift in the kind of um, strategies of the big media companies. So where uh, the NBC, ABC, CBSs of this world were uh, panic-struck in the left, they now own cable networks and, and are trying to uh, reconstitute the economics by sort of participating in the phenomenon. So this you know, where this all goes is, is, is interesting. Yeah. There, there is a kind of consolidation afoot, and it's not, to my way of thinking, entirely accidental and random that Fox is now the owner of MySpace. Yeah. You know, there, is a, there is a sort of economic second response. You know, when railroads get to be too many, pretty soon you have consolidating yeah. uh, railroads. Um, uh, we could talk about I, this well, I, th I think I think about it, um, <laughs> Uh, it's sort of in slightly economic terms. I, before I was at Wired, I was at The Economist, so I've right. been sort of drilled in, in, in economics. Um, you know, we, we see, you know, we now see a huge expansion of supply. Oh, and by the way, before you yeah. go, I want to also make the point that while this looks like some sort of declining business mm. and, you know, let's all uh, diversify into gold and oil, uh, in fact, the media business during the entire uh, slide here has been, you know, lower left to upper right in terms it's, of total dollars. It's remarkable. So Even the number of people involved uh, uh, yeah. and the total economic dimension of this phenomenon has actually gone up with the fractionalization of audiences. You know, one of the one of the paradoxes of our time is how the the market share of the networks went down, but the revenues went up. Yeah. Every year, the upfront. Um, every year, the advertisers pay more and more for a smaller and smaller audience. Um, they had no choice. Now they, now they do have choices. Um, getting back to the economics, we basically have, um, you know, we have supply, a growing pool of supply. We had all the commercial content, both now, both the stuff made now and the stuff made all, all over time. So there's that pool of supply now growing because of the democratization of production. Um, and then you have this demand. All these people who wanted not just what's being broadcast now, but also the stuff that was broadcast last week, last year, ten years ago, yeah. and all those, and the people who wanted all the stuff that wasn't being broadcast at all, but we just couldn't measure right. it. So a huge expansion in supply and a huge expansion in demand. So where's the problem? It's in putting the two together. Now anybody, any you know, any um, institution, and often those institutions are sort of broadcast mechanisms um, that stands in between supply and demand, is going to is going to run into trouble. Fox is an interesting example, is that they're on the supply side. Um, they own content, they you know, have the relationship with the content producers. The affiliates are on the, are, are at the, oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're the <laughs> bottleneck, what, what Steve Jobs refers to as orifices. Right. Um, well, uh, there, there is some roadkill here. <laughs> there, there, is, it, there is indeed. So, so you know, the people who own the content, and the people who can sort of you know, it, it, it catalyze more content, um, want to find a way to reach all this new, new demand. Yeah. The problem is, is that, all, as you said, all the money is coming through these traditional channels. How do you well, manage to... One might argue that the affiliates who are getting killed, who are getting killed in this, are really not media businesses at all. They're distributors. They're, They're distributors. newsstands. Yeah. So, 
Well, I just, oh, I just gave, I just know. gave a, a, a talk at the NA, NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, in, in Las Vegas um, about the sort of decline of the hit, and I hadn't actually realized this is the biggest television conference of, of the year, and I hadn't realized uh, that the B in broadcasting means terrestrial broadcasting. That that is, and that the, most of the people there were radio engineers. Who had, who, you know, brilliant, you know, people who basically built this, you know, built the incredible communication systems we have now. But their their skill set is in sort of tuning signals so they can go out over. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you mean like rabbit ears? Yeah. And I like, wow, that's 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 the way the <laughs> the industry is still organized around and rabbit there's ears. There's still a lot of regulation that's based around the ability for you to put up rabbit ears and get a signal and your right. constitutional right to do that is a lot of the screwiness of the regulatory environment. Exactly. Um, another fractionalized media business was magazines. And I think we're both old enough to remember Life and Look, which were the sort of networks of publishing. Yeah. And that business got creamed and became special interest publishing. But something interesting happened out of that, which is the advertising which supported uh, mass market publishing went away or went to television. Mm -hmm. But another kind of advertising, the, the trout fishing advertiser that advertises in the trout fishing magazine, yeah. came in and created a whole parallel industry. And I, I think in some ways Google AdSense and the application of technology to more rifle shot, you know, if we, you know what is an ad uh, other yeah. than a, a link? Yeah. It's like, hey, if you're interested in this, might you be interested in that? And, and I think that's in its infancy, too. I, 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 I still think the Google AdSense, which is the sort of holy grail of this thing, is really the you know, miniature holy grail, because there's so much more that can be done to try and be smart about. I mean, I, I think Amazon's book finding and book referencing engine, which is based on collaborative filtering, is about 10 times more interesting than yeah. AdSense, which tends to throw up stuff that appears to be relevant, but really isn't. I, I agree. I mean, we, you know, it's interesting. We think, you know, an ad can be defined as something you don't want. It's an interruption. Yeah, it, it's a um, synonym. Whereas something, if, you know, but, but, but a marketing message that is properly targeted is content. And, you know, often you'll find if that, you take you know, a special interest magazine and take the ads out, the audience is less interested. That's right. But that, if that's you take right. the suppository ads out of the football game, that's okay. So the, so, you know, what, the, <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, <laughs> If, if you think about it, um, you know, what's wrong with tele advertising on television is, is the notion of sort of keeping you from what you want by forcing you to watch a message for something you don't, you, you don't intend to buy. Um, it's, that's a, the problem is, is that you've got a one-size-fits-all bucket. You, know, you are willing to broadcast the suppository to you know, 100 million people to reach the 2 million you yeah. actually... And so, so Isn't 98%... There an old joke here about that? Well, it, but it's worse than that. <laughs> it's not half that's wasted. It's 98% <laughs> that, that, that's wasted. And so you're willing to annoy 98% of the population and waste the money yeah. to reach that 2%. If you, but if, on the other hand, you, you could, for example, um, uh, know who that person was watching. Let's say you're distributing the, the Super Bowl now on the Internet, and um, you slot the ads in based on what your knowledge is of who the person yeah. is, how old they are, where they live, etc. Then that goes to, then, then you rather, rather than annoying people with ads they don't want, you're actually giving them things that have a much higher chance of being relevant. I mean, there's a tension here, because I think this is what's going to happen, mm -hmm. frankly. But I think there's an unintended consequence that we're going to live in a very monitored, big brother kind of world where... People know more about you than you maybe really want them to know. Well, and while it's all presented as, hey, we're here to help, and I, I thought you might like a code. Yeah. Know, um, there is a kind of creepy quality to well, uh, knowing the last hundred TV shows I watched. And well, that, that's true. But there I is mean, I give that information to Amazon by virtue of surfing there. Exactly. So it feels harmless, but... Well, I, I, I think I think there's going to be a choice. I mean, I you know I think fundamentally you can sort of opt in, and and you and your inclination to opt in will be based on how relevant the ads are. So you let Amazon track your behavior because you get value from it. You yeah. know, it's a net it's a net positive, and because we probably trust them on on, on some level. Right. Um, but I wouldn't want them to turn that over to the Bush administration to figure out if I'm reading the wrong kind of stuff. Are you? Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. That's the cause of my concern. Um, but, uh, but l l okay, let, let's shift gears a little bit because I want to try and uh, mine this time thing, which, again, I've never really seen anything like the quality of the stuff that you've uh, presented tonight. But 
the other sort of time dimension, the first one is evolution, change, how media changes. And I do want to uh, not, I, I do want to come back to that because I think we're also at the infancy of sort of figuring out what this new, I mean, we're thinking of it as the new cheaper distribution mechanism and enormous impacts take place. Yeah. If you go from 10 channels to 100 channels, it's not a very interesting technological change, but it's a gigantic creative change. Right. Now if you add something which is a genuine technological change like interactivity, we're probably not doing a very good job. I, I remember when I was working at the newspaper when the personal computer first came out, the editor said to me, well, we can't really run a story. I said, well, but people are buying this. This is a phenomenon. Yeah, I can't do it. You know, find out what's the application. Yeah. So I went around and re-interviewed all the people that I spoke to, and I said, what are people going to use computers for? And we came up with uh, filing recipes and writing your own Fortran programs. Right. So we didn't see uh, desktop <laughs> publishing. We didn't see... We didn't even see word processing, never mind the internet or email. So I think we're in that yeah. kind of early pre-D.W. Griffith where we're filming Broadway plays mm -hmm. and calling that a movie. We haven't figured out close-ups and camera tracking or any of that crap, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> the thing I want to talk about is the archival dimension yeah. because um, going along parallel to your talk on this decay of hits, which is certainly quite true, is the loss of material. Yeah. And um, I, 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 again, I don't have an answer or a, a pitch or, or, or like a fundraiser that I'm doing, but I feel that, you know, this happens over and over again. Yeah. Most of the silent movies are gone. Yeah. You read about them and somebody tells you this was a good picture. You say, gee, I, you know, I'm out of curiosity. I'd like to see it. Forget it. it you know, when the yeah. people who have seen it die, it is gone. It never took place, and so it, you know the the you know the recognition that there is value in the archives is just the start. Um, how to extract that value is really really tricky, and we should probably talk about this for a few minutes because there are a lot of dimensions to this. Um, the questions begin to come up. Okay, great. Um, there is. Uh, there's a decay function o o over time. There should be, you know, as I said, the decay function tends to be a power law. It should be a straight line. Instead, we, you know, if you rather than r do film rank here, if you just turn this axis here into into age, you find that you get this also this sort of plummeting effect. Um, this pink bit right here is the is the value of an archive that's untapped. Um, this is a really important issue right now. So, um, as you know, uh, MGM just sold its archive. Um, uh, there are a whole bunch of archives out there that everyone's assuming they have X value. And that X value is based on our sort of existing distribution mechanisms. However, if you switch to abundant distribution systems, that value goes up. Um, we've yeah. been running a kind of, a, again, you know, it's not good enough to publish, but we've been running analysis where we look at sort of the, the sales of things over time, the value of an archive, uh, archive sales, and then draw a straight line and then calculate what this thing here is, and this, this amount right here is basically the difference between what an archive is currently valued at and what it would be valued at in a perfect world. Um, if you're out buying archives, and there's a lot of people who are, um, and you do this analysis and you realize that everyone's underbidding and that you could bid more because you can find a way to tap that, you would have a competitive advantage. And there's, and there's a big, big um, sort of business school and private equity ex exercise going on right now in trying to do this analysis. Um, the reason it's a little tricky is, is, is basically three things. Um, one is, is, is this the, the you know, kind of the format. You know, um, if it's in a, in a, you have to digitize um, archives uh, traditionally, that's, that's costly. Um, sometimes the, it's degraded and you can't get to it. Um, the second big issue is rights. Um, rights is mm. the elephant in the room of the long tail. Um, you cannot clear the rights to old stuff easily, especially the music. Um, a, a famous case is that of WKRP in Cincinnati, which was a 1970s, possibly 80s, uh, a television show that was set in a radio station. Um, there is demand for WKRP in Cincinnati out there. Um, and the problem is, is that throughout the entire show, there's music of this era playing in the background. And the cost to clear all the music playing in the background at WKRP in Cincinnati is, is ruinous. And it has become the sort of the case study. It is the hardest nut to crack in all of television. Yeah. And if you can find a way to clear the rights to WKRP in Cincinnati, you can clear the rights to everything. But we haven't yet. And so we don't know how to tap well, I, that. I would imagine that 
the cost of clearing the rights in 2006 was higher than the cost of buying the rights when the show was made. That's right. They've tried doing things like changing the music. Um, the problem is that the people who are really buying it for nostalgic reasons remember the music. And they're like, that's not WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> so it, it's, you know, um, I, you know, the company, person, legislator who can figure out how to clear rights on an industrial level, batch process, really, really efficiently, is going to be able to transform this industry. Well, you've probably uh, talked to and thought about uh, Larry Lessig's views on these subjects. Do you want to... Well, so, yeah, this is interesting. So Give us Chris's view of yeah, Larry's l l view. Yeah, I'll try not to do violence to Larry's view. Larry Lessig is the Stanford um, uh, University law professor who has been um, opposing the extension of copyright. Um, basically, every year, every 10 years, copyright gets extended another 10 years. This is largely to protect um, uh, Disney's properties, Mickey Mouse and, 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 and all that. Uh, so, exactly. Um, <laughs> now, Larry's view... Um, and this is where I'm probably going to do a slight injustice to him. Larry's view is that, is that older stuff doesn't have that much value, and therefore we don't need to protect its rights. 50 years, 40 years of copyright extension is enough, and anything beyond that, that the, that the, sort of the, the social benefit of l getting it out there so we can all use it, much as Disney used classic fairy tales that were in public domain to build its movies, that there's a value in just, in just freeing it up. And at a certain point, you sort of say the value has been extracted, the, you know, the, the money has been, has been you know, sort, of, sort of made on this property, and there's a social benefit in letting it out. Um, I, I'm very sympathetic to this point of view, except for the fact that it runs squarely against the long tail. Uh, the long tail says, that in fact, there is value in the archive, that, that we've been underestimating the, you know, the demand uh, for old stuff, not overestimating it, and that um, if you could only free it up, you would find that it has economic value, not just cultural value. So um, I think there's a way to square these two. And, um, one of the, and, and, and the, the problem with copyright law right now is that it automatically uh, is conferred. It's automatically extended whether people want it to or not. Um, what Larry has, re has suggested, and others, is, is this sort of a de minimis $1 renewal. You basically have to put up your hand and say, yes, please. That's all you need to do, a penny, a penny renewal. And simply just saying, please renew it, that's enough. You, you, know, you cared enough to, to, to have it renewed. Um, the presumption is, is that 99% of the stuff, actually no one wants it renewed. And in fact, maybe they maybe didn't want the copyright protection in the first place. It wasn't intended to have that kind of protection. And that most content would then fall into the public domain simply because no one cared enough to, to extend it. Yeah, it's a very mixed picture here. I mean, leaving aside maybe the important question of social policy, yeah. but I think economically, uh, Larry is wrong. There's lots of examples of archives becoming more valuable. You know, you right. mentioned the MGM case. That was a library that was sold twice. Mm. It was considered valueless, sold to Ted Turner. He bought it for 10 years. When he finished exploiting, it was considered valueless again. And now it sold last year to Comcast and Sony. So it, it doesn't seem to be going down in no. value. No, it's going And up. yet the pictures are getting older and older, and they're black and white. And so but, yeah. there's that problem. Then there's this other oddball problem of old books. You know, I mean, I think we all have know people or have friends who have published a book it goes out of print, you cannot get the rights back as the yeah. author, and, you know, um, I, I, that seems like a tragic the, circumstance as well, where the rights are sort of, it, it's kind of the rights problem in another shape or guise in the sense that something is imprisoned rights or, or imprisoned content exactly. rather than disappearing content. Exactly. Books are a fascinating example. Um, the rise of the secondary market in used books has transformed the industry. So, you know, the traditional notion is that books go out of print and then they're not available. Um, but by simply networking all the used bookstores and basically allowing them, sort of having them type in their inventory and then collecting that inventory a single place, um, a, a Libris is one company, it's a local company that does this, but Amazon lists used books right next to the, the, the new books. Um, basically, uh, it has created a liquid market in used books yeah. that, that makes it so that nothing ever goes out of print. If, if, it's, if it's not available at the top line, buy it new. It's available at the next line, buy it used. Um, you know, the book is often in sort of similar condition, and um, the only difference is that the author doesn't get any money from it. When you yeah. buy it used, it's your, you, know, you pay the used bookstore, but nothing goes back to the author. And this notion of reselling um, old books um, is, is great for our culture and for us as consumers that we now, so out of print is out of fashion. Out of print is no longer meaningful. 
Um, but it doesn't solve the problem from the author's perspective. And you're right, it's hard for them to get back the rights. And sometimes yeah. they don't even want to, this is an interesting thing, sometimes they don't even want to switch to print on demand. Because print on demand books tend to be more expensive than, than, than new books. And a lot of authors say, if you make me a print on demand book, you're going to keep the book. You're going to keep it as a in your catalog. It's now going to cost twice or you know 50% more than it used to cost. And I'm not going to get, and my sales aren't going to go up. If you would give it back to me, I would you know, talk to a more you know, creative publisher, and they would, find, they would market it, and they would give it the audience it deserves. And you, do, you, by turning it into a print-on-demand book, are actually ruining my market. And it's yeah, a debate not yet solved. I don't know about the dollar to renew, but I do think there ought to be some sort of principle in law that if I bought the rights to something, and I, I own them, and I tie them up, and I'm supposed to be economically exploiting them, yeah. and I'm not doing that, then right. I think they should revert. It should be, OK, you did. Your time's up. <laughs> you have to either keep paying me and keep, ex I mean, I, what yeah. I hate to see is a filmmaker makes a movie, struggles to get the thing funded, and then can't hang on to any rights because in order to get the theatrical release, you've got to give up rights. And, and the contracts read on any planet, right. any universe, known or unknown, technology, <laughs> invented or not invented, or, <laughs> I mean, these are incredibly broad waivers yeah. of rights. And, you know, great. If you want to exploit the rights to print my book on Frisbees, great. But then print it on Frisbees. Well, I think one thing we can be sure of is that Congress will not solve this problem. <laughs> um, so I think this is a, it's a great opportunity right now. I think this is an entrepreneurial opportunity. We're in the right place for people to think of, of creative ways to route around this problem, offer an economic incentives, technological abilities, um, demonstrate the demand out there so that the owners of these rights, the people okay. who are keeping these, these sort of valuable cultural commodities locked up in, in warehouses, see the opportunity, see the, the way and the reason to get it out there. Okay, well, I'm going to dive into the questions here because they're building up. Um, I'm not sure I've done a good job of organizing them, but let's just dive in. Mm -hmm. uh, question, not all niche content decays in popularity. Some grow out of the niche and become more popular as they get older. H how do you spot these sleeper hits in the long tail? Yeah, time? This, is, this is a great question. Um, actually, the... Uh, the opening anecdote in my in my article and still appears um, somewhere in the book is the is the uh, is a book called uh, Touching the Void. It's about a mountain climbing tragedy, and uh, the book came out um, in the uh, 80s, and it was sort of you know modestly successful, um, and then as books tend to do, sort of fell off the uh, the cliff and was um, uh, eventually uh, um, sort of destined to go out of print, and then um, John Krakauer released Touching the Void, um, sorry, Into Thin Air, which was another big hit. And people said, you know, this, um, there's a book a lot like this book uh, that I remember. And they sort of, you know, <laughs> they sort of, you know, mentioned it. And someone sort of did a little work and found it and wrote about it in the reviews and in Into Thin Air. And people checked it out. It's like, it's fantastic. And they rediscovered the book. And then, and uh, two years later, Touching the Void was outselling Into Thin Air. Um, wow. You see this often when someone dies, for example. You often see their body of work becomes more popular. Um, when, an, when an actor releases a new movie, the old, movie, it, the old movies by that actor um, become more popular. So there's always opportunities for yeah. confluence of events or, or, or sort of increase in celebrity um, can drive demand back into the catalog. It's a funny point. You're absolutely right. There are, when you see a movie star die, you'll see a spike in the DVD rentals of their titles. It's just right there like a... Um, here's a question from Kevin Kelly. Chris, are you suggesting that technology does not change the power law, only exploits it more fully? Does that mean that the shape of the curve will be the same in 200 years? Once we have access to infinite shelf space, is that the end of history? Is it possible technology can alter the power curve itself in the long term? I think, I think Kevin is, um, is not asking the, uh, the um, you know, the question sounds like, which is like, does the shape stay exactly the same? Obviously, as the tail grows, the curve becomes a little flatter. It's still a power law, but it's not quite as steep. The hits aren't quite the, the, the ratio between hits and niches is, you know, sort of evens a little bit. Um, but that, I think he's actually asking another question, which is that does do we stop having power laws altogether? Do we actually go to a sort of a straight a straight line of, of demand? Equally distributed. Yeah, Ke Kevin, am I, is that what you're asking? Um, I think the answer is no, and let, let me. Explain Let's explain why three. Uh, explain why I think that. So three factors make a power law. You need to have. Um, you need to have. Uh, 
Uh, variety, so lots of different things. Inequality, some things, depending on your, whatever your measure is, some things better than the others. And then something that economists call network effects, and you can think of that as word of, word of mouth. When you have variety and inequality, the network effects identify the sort of the buzzy ones, and they get, and the network effects amplify um, signals. So, you know, sort of word of mouth amplifies the good and tends to suppress the bad. So what you're seeing here is, is, um, is th this, this steepness is what network effects do. It amplifies this side and suppresses that side. I think as long as you have network effects, you're always going to have, um, you're always going to have a power law shape. Network effects tend to amplify inequality. So if you have variety and inequality, as long as you have network effects, you won't get straight lines, but will instead get exponentials. Uh, one of the things, and I hadn't, I hadn't noticed this the first time I saw your talk, is that, is that this power law sort of persists well out to a certain yeah. sort of zone, the, the bathosphere, and then it, it kind of drops off. And, and you relate that to shelf space. Scarcity effects of right. various so, sorts. So it does, I, I mean, it, it sounds like uh, you are saying that with the growth of shelf space, that drop-off point moves, yeah. you know, the, the curve clings to the power law longer before it falls into the, the merely irrelevant. <laughs> Let me show you another piece of data. This is, um, this is a little bit naughty since I, I, this hasn't been published yet, but let me see if, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring out my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm not going to pull it up. It's too embarrassing. Um, uh, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to um, show the um, uh, the Netflix data. Um, the Netflix uh, data um, also also does does this, um, but it does it much much further out. And um, you know, we thought about this. Why is that? So Netflix has infinite shell space. It has excellent findability. So the two, the two usual scale, uh, scarcity effects are, and we do this in business schools, by the way. We look, at, we look at data and we sort of say, okay, you business school students are about to graduate and go into the world and start new companies. That's where you start a company. Right there is the scarcity effect. If you can eliminate that scarcity effect, you just you, you move the curve back onto the straight, the straight line. So what is that? And so in some cases, that's shelf space. In other cases, it's that search problem. It's the, it's the yeah. transaction costs of finding something. But Netflix doesn't have that. Netflix has great findability, great, great shelf space. And yet it, too, falls off at around, um, at around uh, uh, the last 5,000 titles fall off. We think, and I don't know this, but we think uh, they're a foreign language. Um, we, we think that you actually have a little sort of a, a scarcity effect in English. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think... Uh I would argue is a permanent feature is that there will be a, a left side of the power curve. I don't think there will be an equidistributed sort of curve, even with infinite and beyond shelf space, because there's sort of a need in the world for Super Bowls and these yeah. occasional events. There are products like Coke right. that need those events, and there are maybe some tribal things that we need to do all on the same day. Fewer and fewer smaller percentage of our lives, but occasionally we need those I totally agree. holidays and New Year's and elections and yeah. things that sort of connect the tribe together for a while. I, I agree entirely. I mean, uh, one of the big sort of misunderstandings of the long tail is that it's the end of hits and the sort of, you know, the, the, the uh, ubiquity of niches. It, in fact, it's just, it's just the sort of the end of the tyranny of hits. And now you're going to have a kind of a balanced market between hits and niches. You know, we're a gregarious species. We like to do things that other people are doing. But we're not as gregarious as, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of hit-driven economy of the last hundred years suggested. That amplified the gregariousness. And some of those 75% of American homes really did want to watch I Love Lucy. And some of them watched it because it was the only thing on. And, and, that's, and that, that's that yeah, other part. I mean, uh, my bet, and I, I guess if I really was serious about it, Stuart would make me sign up for one of his long bets. But my bet is that in 50 years, there'll still be seven studios. There'll still be a, a handful of corporate entities that are trying to make hits. Yeah. Even though they may have a vanishingly small percentage of the total audience, there's going to be a need for uh, that part of the ecosystem. Let me, um, I, let me, I can pull up something that will uh, speak to that uh, precisely. Um, so music is, music is a, is a fascinating um, industry. We've been looking at it closely because it's, it's, it's um, really sort of the canary in the coal mine. Um, this, is, uh, this is how we measure hits in gold records, uh, 500, 1 million, and multi-million. Um, 
look at that. Uh, 2000, uh, it turns out that NSYNC's second album, No Strings Attached, released on March 21st, 2000, was the high water mark of the blockbuster century. Uh, notable, <laughs> not it's, it's very poignant. It's the first day of spring of the new century. It was five days after the NASDAQ crash. It launched Justin Timberlake's career. Um, and, and, <laughs> and it was um, a, uh, it sold uh, 2.4 million uh, copies in its first week, um, a number I believe will never be passed. <laughs> There will never again be well, an album as big as No like Strings data Attached. To get rid of bad theories. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the other thing I would say is I, I do think, and sort of thinking about Kevin's question one more time, that there is a different sort of physics working on the curve when you get into millions of channels. Then these promotion problems, uh, my partner John Doerr is fond of saying that every great internet business has been based on finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah. But these search problems and what the filmmaker tends to think of as the promotion problem. I, I interviewed uh, Paul Kagan many years ago and uh, sort of pre-visualized with him this world where the filmmaker and the film viewer would connect together. And he said, you know, this is sort of a Silicon Valley fantasy that all it really takes is somebody with a story and somebody else that wants to hear it. But there's a middle piece we'll call promotion. And that's what the studios really do. You know, it's not just distribution. It's not just funding production. There's this hoopla element. Now, that, 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 it, that, when you get to a million titles, I don't think you can do it by you, buying you, television you, time. You can't, exactly. So social networking, to some extent, is becoming the, the when, new way in which we can automate word of mouth absolutely. and we can provide sort of new generation promotion. I mean, if you ask Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, what the most important thing about Netflix is, he won't say it's, you know, um, infinite variety, um, um, or, or you know, unlimited or unlimited rentals, or no late fees. He says it is um, the marketing power of recommendations. Um, when you think about it, um, it costs Netflix absolutely nothing to recommend a title to you. Um, it, it, sees your, it sees what other people liked, it sees what you've rented in the past, and it reconfigures its its storefront, as it were, to give you something uh, that you, it thinks you'll like. Um, that has all the power of advertising. It's just like marketing. It's the same effect of marketing, but it doesn't cost anything. And the notion of zero-cost marketing is the, is the silver bullet you know, for, for, for films. Well, you almost need it, because I mean, the, 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 long, the longer part of the tale chokes if you don't Absolutely. find some way to, to find things. I mean, this Absolutely. is what you know, uh, Google came along at sort of the right moment when, it, when the traditional search engines weren't uh, doing very well. I have a close friend of mine in Silicon Valley who came up with the idea for a pre-Google company, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll uh, let people buy their way up the relevance ranking. Yeah. And this had the effect of sort of polluting the quality of the search results. And Google sort of arrived on the scene and said, we're not going to do that. We're going to have an ad edit separation. Mm -hmm. wow, what, what an amazing yeah. novel idea. But I mean, I wouldn't really want to read the New York Times reviews of movies if I thought the number of stars correlated to the ad budget of the studio that made the movie. And this is what was happening in the internet. But uh, you do have these, these problems when you go to a million titles. You've got to have an honest way to, to find things and to be recommended things. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, um, you know, I think the marketplace solves this one. Um, but I mean, just, just to, your, to your point about movies, um, here I wanted to show you one, um, one uh, you know, you think of this as being the golden era of the blockbuster, but uh, the portion of, of the total revenues that are blockbusters is falling, and the cost, which is mostly the wow. marketing cost and, the st and paying the stars, is rising. This is the television graph moved over. This is, you know, yeah. even, even Hollywood, which we thought was the last remaining blockbuster industry, the wheels are starting to fall off yeah, there, too. Yeah, right. And this year, as, as you know, uh, box office was the uh, you know, worst year, I guess, worst fall in 20 years last year. And I think there are more film festivals today. There's sort of one or two every night of the year as opposed to a handful of festivals. So we're, we're OK. Um, let's do a better job on questions. Can you relate the long tail to the current trend on the supply side where consumers are becoming creators? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is you know, I mean, again, the, the YouTube phenomenon, MySpace, Wikipedia, um, the blogosphere. Um, this, this is what I, when I talk about the democratization of production, the democratization of distribution, you know, we're talking about blogs. We're talking about, uh, about uploading, you know, videos of yourself lip syncing. Um, they're, they're the most popular ones. <laughs> um, 
uh, you know, I, I bang on a lot about this, this sort of um, elitism that we've had that professionals produce. Um, yes, professionals produce. And the reason professionals produce is because, they, because only they had the keys to the, to, you know, to the, to the, the machine. To the, you know, the, machi you know, the, you know you, the notion that you, know, you needed a printing press uh, to be a publisher. Um, every blogger right now has a printing press. Um, everybody who has a, a, you know, a broadband connection has access to a video distribution network that rivals you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest studios in terms of its reach. So I think that, you know, that you're seeing the rise of kind of mass amateurism. You know, the, the rise, you know, we've had this assumption that talent is sort of you know, scarce and that you need this sort of big filtering you know, process to identify you know, the good people and let them into the machine. It turns out that talent, talent is very widely distributed. Um, and far more widely distributed than our, than our, uh, than our distribution um, you know, institutions. And something like YouTube, something like Wikipedia, something like the blogosphere, suddenly allows talent to identify itself, and then all those network effects of just sort of, you know, we're very, very good at spotting stuff and bringing it to the attention of others with, through links, through Google, and everything else. We're now starting to find out just how rich our culture is in terms of talent, and in variety as well. You're seeing stuff that isn't just as good as the stuff that was commercially produced, but never would have been produced, just to come, come, coming from left field. Yeah, it's a very interesting moment. Uh, thinking of television for a second, too. Television news basically doesn't exist today because what we're seeing, I mean, there are reporters maybe in San Francisco covering San Francisco stories, or at least holding a camera up in front of a San Francisco story. But... Yes. Um, <laughs> The international news, which used to have, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make a slightly retro point here, but in the era of 20 years ago, uh, there was a notion of a professional journalist. I'm not saying let's race back to that era. What I'm saying is that notion is utterly gone. And what we are seeing as so-called professional journalism is really freelance material shot in Baghdad, shipped to New York, somebody voiceovers it. And, and, and that's yeah. supposed to be live news. Yeah. And, and we're covering uh, Israel out of London, we're covering Nairobi out of Tokyo. You know, we're kidding ourselves. So in a way, I think the cure is not to go backwards, but to go forwards and to, get, and to label that stuff and get more of that material and kind of do away with this pseudo-professional news, which it really isn't. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if we're gonna have citizen journalism, then let's, let's have it. I mean, I, I guess I, you know, I, I feel very conflicted about this. I mean, you know, on, with one hat, I'm, I mean, a Condé Nast editor. You know, the very sort of, you know, sort of, sort of the embodiment of the old style of, you know, sort of elite, you know, premier, big production process, you know, journalism. On the other side, I'm a blogger. Um, my peers in the blogosphere are, are, are any one of you. Um, they're engineers. They're, they're, they're students. They're retired people. They, I don't care. Um, we've decredentialized de journalism. Um, my, the people I respect the most are the people who have something to say, who have sort of, you know, who have um, unique information, unique perspective, unique articulation, yeah. and I don't care what their affiliation is. Whereas the journalistic model was you needed the press card. Yeah. You needed to have that association to be respected. Well, I, um, at the risk of uh, going down the, the wrong path, my concern, uh, simultaneous and, and on the same topic is, I'm concerned that what we now call journalism, and I'm thinking of television mm -hmm. maybe uh, more, is really just opinion mongering. So Fox gets a bunch of guys up to talk about the news, none of whom are eyewitnesses to anything. Yeah. And then another network gets up another bunch, you know, McNeil Lehrer gets a conservative to argue with an arch conservative over some <laughs> point. And uh, neither one of these people is, you know, a principal, is an, it's not an actual interview. It's, it's a tertiary news event. And, I, you know, great. But, but to me, the, these are just, you know, bloggers that get airtime. Yeah. You know, there is such a thing as an eyewitness reporter. There is such a thing as getting the facts straight. That's not the same thing as saying objectivity rules and opinion is worth nothing. But there, there is some difference between, hey, I was there. This is what I saw. And, uh, oh, yes, I'm an expert on that subject. Let me tell you yeah. what... Uh, the correct viewpoint is to have. I, I think you're exactly right, but I think here's the good news. Um, I think the marketplace is going to sort this this out. Um, you know, once upon a time, if there were only so many channels, you know, there was kind of a social responsibility for those channels to be good, yeah. to be responsible. Um, now, when there's an infinite number of channels, if they suck, 
they're going to be replaced by somebody who's doing it better. Yeah. Well, I bring it on. Uh, and that is a little bit like this question because this is kind of a you got to go one way or the other question. Does the fractionalization of channels in all media types, does it, does it portend a better, higher quality of social evolution due to more experimentation or a lower quality due to the lack of cohesion and cooperation? Yeah. And it's a great question. This is the whole kind of, you know, sort of, is, is a balkanized culture a, a good culture? Um, I have a chapter on this um, in the book. Um, unsurprisingly, I, I think that uh, it's a net positive. Um, I think, uh, th what I think is that we're going from an era where we've been sort of, because of the incredible powerful broadcast technology, which broadcast is a great way to sort of reach a lot of people with a small amount of stuff. Um, I think that our linkages, to the extent we've been watching the same things at the same time, listening to the same things at the same time, we have sort of, um, we have sort of very, very wide but shallow links with each other. Um, you know, the fact that we both watched I Love Lucy is not really a, a very strong, you know, connective tissue between us. Um, now we're not, we, now we're, we're, those, those weak links are breaking. Instead, what we're doing is we're having more of a tribal uh, culture, where what I do is I find my passions and I can pursue them to the ends of the world and I can find people who share my passions. And so now I have a smaller number of tighter connections. So I think that, I think we've gone from, you know, sort of, you, you're right, on some level, you know, um, we as a nation are not one, are not one sort of, you know, lockstep culture. Um, but I think uh, what we've discovered is that within our, within our country has been a has been a, a sort of a, a, you know, a depth and a variety that was suppressed by the, uh, by the economics and physics of broadcast, and we're discovering that we do have these passions that we share with people who aren't around us, but we can find them elsewhere. What this does to, you know, to, to politics, what this does to our sense of, uh, of being an American, what this sense of, does to our, our sense of being part of our time, we don't know yet. Um, I think it's gonna, it's gonna evolve, but I'm optimistic that, that, that tighter but fewer connections are probably gonna be a net positive. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll just chime in behind you because I think, in terms of my own taste, I really prefer to be disagreed with. I learn more that way. I don't really want to be in a culture where everybody is like me and we all agree yeah. and we're right. And you know, it just seems icky, awful. Um, okay, question from Mark. Uh, it could be argued that current classics benefited from the marketing forces of their era uh, to ever become or be deemed a classic. How do you think the long tail affects the factors that determine what is a classic in the future? Yeah. It's not just as simple as quality will trump hype. Is there more to it? I, you know, I think it might be as simple as that, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, if you go back and, I mean, I, it's an interesting exercise. I wish I had the chart here. But um, if you go back and look at the Academy Award winners, um, or even the number one, al one, number one films from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it's amazing how many you've never heard of. They just disappeared. They were like the biggest film of their day, and they're gone. Um, and yet some of the films from those days aren't gone. So I think that time does actually, you know, time plus quality allows, you know, the winners to, 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 to rise. Well, I do think the time thing, and, and it's illustrated by your uh, quantitative stuff, but I do think, you know, you're talking about the sort of uh, random... Uh, quality of a uh, something that's being promoted as a hit, yeah. and it maybe it becomes a hit, maybe it doesn't, but the promotion sounds pretty Absolutely. good. The actual experience is a little more random. Now, when the thing is 20 years old, it may be for me or it may not be for me, but I pretty much know what it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I know what a John Wayne movie is. Yeah, it's not like what is that, and so I think there's a sort of relaxation effect that is underlying some of the numbers that, that you talked about, where it becomes sort of located. And maybe it changes over time mm -hmm. slowly, but you know, it's a known thing, which is why there is a satisfaction, because I, d I don't get accidental stuff. I, right. I, I, I know what I'm looking for, exactly. and indeed, I'm able to find it. Exactly, I think you know, being able to see past the marketing blitz actually reveals the true, the true you know, characteristics of the, of the product, um, you know, as, as determined by the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, okay, let's, we have t at least two more questions. Um, the long tail, uh, although formerly truncated, is now open for business. This presumably means many more fringe concepts, once excluded from the big screens, are now accessible to us all. 
What do you think are the political implications of uh, this? Yeah. <sighs> you, you answer that one. Uh, I, I'm in a sour mood about politics. Uh, because I, I worry a lot that we're becoming an opinionocracy. And I, and I am a little bit on a soapbox that, that um, I enjoy that. I'm a participant. I'm a consumer of it. But I, I like your, I, I occasionally like to be refreshed by somebody with facts and numbers. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was uh, kind of uh, tricked into believing in this scientific method that we could disagree, but we might reach a proposition that we could then sort of settle by the facts. And we could, we could make a bet, and one of us would win and one of us would lose. And I would hate to see the sort of everything is equal and everything is relative and objectivity doesn't exist become a, hey, you know, opinion trumps reality. So that's my little soapbox about yeah. the, the uh, sort of momentary degradation of political discourse as we're democratizing and opening things up. I, I, I agree. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll hazard a kind of a structural theory about what might happen with politics. Um, maybe the two-party system is uh, a scarcity effect. Um, may, maybe it's that... Maybe it's that we just don't have a way to tap the diversity of opinions, the diversity of views that we have, and we have to, we have to collapse this kind of distributed function into this two-hump um, function, because we don't have a better, a better way. I don't know exactly what that better way is. I don't know if it's direct democracy or just sort of more efficient spreading of messages or better representative democracy. I, d I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, the trends suggest that we, we as a population are more diverse than just two poles. So, one, one can hope. Um, this may be the last question, and then we have to wing it, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, big finish. Big finish. <laughs> how, does, how do the editorial roles change as the distribution bottleneck opens up? As editors, how do you feel about these shifts? Any ideas on the future of editors? in yeah. new and news and products and and is this good or bad for consumers yeah no, this is this is a, a great one as i say I'm, I'm hugely conflicted about all these things um i i i i talk about um the the notion of um pre-filters and post filters um and i'm going to try um this is always risky to mess around with um powerpoint uh, on stage um we are, we, editor's job is to be the, you know, exactly what the long tail um, uh, uh, advises against. We, uh, we decide what gets out there. Our job is to guess at what's going to be popular. We have a limited number of pages, limited number of channels, limited number of time. And so we try to guess at what people are going to want, and we then, um, and, uh, and we then predict uh, the, the demand, and we try to um, get it um, out there. Um, so, um, we're, you know, the, the whole notion of, of, of the long tail is that this is the wrong way to do it. Um, rather than predicting demand, rather than trying to guess at what people want, what you do is you let it all out there and the marketplace sorts it out. Um, you know, YouTube, no one, there's no editor for YouTube who says, you know, that's not going to be popular, we're not going to put it out there. Um, instead, it gets out there and, 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 you know, the viewers decide what, what's, what, what's popular. Um, so, so here, so these are, these are kind of the pre-filters. We, we, as, we as editors, um, you know, are, are keeping, stu keeping, keeping stuff away from people. That's what our job is. Um, studio executives, you know, say no. That their job is to, is to, is to red light things. You know, we think about the green lights, but most of what they do is red lights. This department store buyers, um, their job is to sort of try to guess what people want. Whereas in the long tail markets, it all gets out there because you have unlimited uh, distribution. And, 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 and after the fact, post facto, um, the, you know, the, 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 you know, we now can measure what the people want. Rather than guessing, we measure. So what's the role of an editor in a world where the marketplace can do our job for us? And I think, I think this gets down to the, the notion of recommendations. Um, I think the job of an editor is, is to be a, um, a, an arbor, a, 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 um, a, to have a sensibility and a taste and a discrimination of quality that can sort of point out the stuff that's out there and say, this is good, that's good, and this is good. Kevin, Kevin Kelly has a, has a, a fantastic uh, 
a blog and newsletter where he sort of identifies cool tools out there. He didn't decide which tools could get out there. He didn't make those tools themselves. What he does is he, is he anoints them as being cool. And because people, un, because Kevin is a person and people you have, respect his taste and, and share his sensibility, that, that editing role of identifying something as cool becomes a hugely powerful driver to demand. And Kevin, you may be able to speak at what, what, the, what the Kelly effect is on sales, <laughs> but I imagine it's not, it's not trivial. So maybe that is the role of, of, of the editor, is to, is, to, is to have a sensibility, a very sort of a branded, a branded personality, a branded sort of worldview, and that to then filter the great volume of stuff out there through this worldview so that people who share that worldview can find it. Yeah, I, um, I guess I think the traditional editor in the sense of gatekeeper is finished. I don't think there will ever be in, in this kind of culture, this kind of communications culture, we've crossed some threshold. And I think the traditional, uh, dare I say it, sort of Hurstian model yeah. of somebody that <laughs> can make someone a king or ruin somebody, I think that's really just finished. Yeah. It just isn't going to exist anymore. I do agree with you that I know people, and, and, and maybe we all know people who have great taste and whose movie recommendations are remarkably good. But even critics, I think, have lost some of their power, right? I mean, I'm interested in critics now more because they write well or yeah. because they think like I do. And I'm not going to go to a restaurant or not go to a movie or read a book or not read a book because some critic tells me I should or shouldn't do this. It's just finished. Yeah. Um, there also are other sort of uh, mechanisms of sort of emergent um, behavior reinforcement. I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> Where I find that if, if you, uh, a friend of mine has a website that, where people sort of pick interesting uh, videos on the net. Yeah. And all he, he, all he has to do is show uh, people whose picks are liked by other people. He doesn't even have to tell you why these picks are good or what method this person uses. But the community says, oh, that's how you become a well-read blogger. Uh, OK, I, I think I know what's going on. And, and they, they almost model the behavior without an editor sort of saying, this is interesting and that's not it. It almost, it, it's not even a, a, a kind of democratization. It's an emergent behavior the of, of the community. Um, and then the last thing I would say is I think editors might still exist as coaches. Yeah. I mean, I still think it's fun to work with a young writer, help them become better, suggest an idea, hey, read this book. This is the kind of writing that is, reminds me of what you're trying to do. That part of editing still exists, but the gatekeeping part is finito. I'll, I'll finish with just one little irony. My book on the rise of niches is being, pu is being published by Disney. <laughs> uh, Dis Disney's book subsidiary, Hyperion, um, is, 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 is my publisher. Um, I didn't need them for distribution. I didn't need them for production. I needed them for advice. They, they made it a better book, they edited it. They did what editors used to do, which is make things better. And um, you know, I think that's, that may be their role going forward. Great. We're all editors. <laughs>